You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. What's something you learned in history class that you feel like wasn't the whole truth? Better yet, what's something you didn't learn at all that was omitted completely? That's what I like to call redacted history. My name is Andre White, the host of the Redacted History Podcast, the place where history's forgotten events, heroes, and villains get their story told, one episode at a time. The Redacted History Podcast. Real history never dies. Stream the Redacted History Podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you get your podcasts. At last, in our immediate front, at 1 p.m., there suddenly leaped from one of our cannons a single, sharp, far-reaching sound, breaking the long-continued silence and echoing along the extended lines of battle. All were now at a strained attention, then quickly followed another gun. Friend and foe at once recognized that these were signal guns. Then hundreds of cannon opened upon each other. What a roar! How incessant! The earth trembled under the mighty resound of cannon. The air darkened with sulfurous clouds. The whole valley is enveloped. The sun, lately so glaring, is itself obscured. Nothing can be seen but the flashing light leaping from the cannon's mouth amidst the surrounding smoke. The air, which was so silent and serene, is now full of exploding and screaming shells and shot. Lieutenant J.F. Crocker, 9th Virginia Infantry, Armistead's Brigade, Pickett's Division, Longstreet's Corps, Army of Northern Virginia. Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 373 of our Civil War podcast. My name is Rich. And I'm Tracy. Hello y'all. Thanks for tuning in to the podcast. As you guys will recall, at the end of the last show, the big Confederate artillery bombardment preceding Pickett's charge had just started on the afternoon of Friday, July 3rd, 1863, the third day of the Battle of Gettysburg. In all, anywhere from 155 to 170 Confederate guns were in position to hammer the Federal line. Shortly after 1 o'clock, when the two cannons of Louisiana's celebrated Washington artillery, positioned near the Peach Orchard, opened fire in quick succession, shattering the afternoon quiet that had had enveloped the battlefield, it was the signal the rebel gunners had been waiting for. For the next hour or so, the very earth trembled in what would prove to be the largest and most sustained artillery fire of the entire war. In letters home or in their memoirs, those who had survived the bloodshed that day did their best to describe it. Years afterward, Captain John Dooley of the 1st Virginia in Kemper's Brigade said, quote, Never will I forget those scenes and sounds. The earth seemed unsteady beneath the furious cannonade, and the air might be said to be agitated by the wings of death. Federal soldiers across the way left similar descriptions. One man, one of the survivors of the battered 1st Minnesota in Hancock's 2nd Corps, recalled the scene vividly. Quote, There was an incessant, discordant flight of shells, seemingly in and from all directions. Howling, shrieking, striking, exploding, tearing, smashing, and destroying. The ground was torn up, fences and trees knocked to splinters, rocks and small stones were flying in the air, ammunition boxes and caissons were exploded, guns were dismounted, and men and horses were torn to pieces. We commended our souls to God, 
shut our teeth hard and lay flat on the ground, expecting every minute to be blown to atoms. Almost instantly afterwards, the whole air above and around was filled with bursting and screaming projectiles and the continuous thunder of the guns, telling us that something serious was at hand. All jumped to their feet, and loud calls were made for horses, which orderlies hurried forward with, already saddled and waiting. Mine did not come at once, and anxious to get upon my line, I started on a run, up a little swale leading directly up to the center of it. Every moment or so a shell would burst, throwing its fragments about in the most disagreeably promiscuous manner, or, first striking the ground, plow a great furrow in the earth and rocks, throwing these last about in a way quite as dangerous as the pieces of the exploding shell. At last I reached the brow of the hill to find myself in the most infernal pandemonium it has ever been my fortune to look upon. Very few troops were in sight, and those that were were hugging the ground closely, some behind the stone wall, some not. But the artillerymen were all busily at work at their guns, thundering out defiance to the enemy, whose shells were bursting in and around them at a fearful rate, striking now a horse, now a limber box, and now a man. One thing which forcibly occurred to me was the perfect quiet with which the horses stood in their places. Even when a shell, striking in the midst of a team, would knock over one or two of them, or hurl one struggling in his death agonies to the ground, the rest would make no effort to struggle or escape, but would stand stoically by, as if saying to themselves, It is fate. It is useless to try to avoid it. As I reached the line just to the left of Cushing's battery, I found General Webb seated on the ground as coolly as though he had no interest in the scene. And somehow it seemed to me that in such a place, men appeared to take things a good deal as I had remarked the horses took them. Of course it would be absurd to say we were not scared. How is it possible for a sentient being to be in such a place and not experience a sense of alarm. None but fools, I think, can deny that they are afraid in battle. How long did this pandemonium last? Measured by our feelings, it might have been an age. In point of fact, it may have been an hour, or three, or five. The measurement of time under such circumstances, regular as it is by the watch, is exceedingly uncertain by the watchers. Getting tired of seeing men and horses torn to pieces and observing that although some of the shells struck and burst among us, most of them went high and burst behind us, the idea occurred to me that a position farther to the front would be safer. I walked forward accompanied by my aide, Lieutenant Haskell. Passing the clump of trees referred to as marking this point of our line, we walked forward to the fence where the men were lying close behind it and motioned them to make room for me. I stepped over the wall, went to a little clump of bushes standing just in front of the line and looked out there to see if I could detect any movement going on in that direction. Nothing could be seen but the smoke constantly issuing from the enemy guns the screaming of countless projectiles as they rushed through the air in all directions, and the bursting of shells. These all went over our heads and generally burst behind us. After standing here for some time, we walked down to the left, still outside the line of battle, the men peering at us curiously from behind the stone wall as we passed along. I called Lieutenant Haskell's attention to a man who had evidently left his regiment to get some water. Around his neck were hung several canteens, and he was crawling back as close to the earth as possible, evidently fearful of the shot and shell roaring over his head. As we came nearer, I called out to him, Look out, my man, you might get hit. At the sound of my voice, he turned his head, still keeping it as close to the ground as possible, to look at me, and then, as if inspired by a new idea, rose to his feet and walked deliberately back to his regiment, 
no doubt arguing with himself that if two could walk erect, there was little danger to a third. Passing round the left of my line, I was proceeding behind it up towards the right when I noticed a man coming across the field carrying another, evidently wounded, on his back. Just as they came opposite to us, they encountered a low stone wall over which the one was trying to climb with the other still on his back. I stopped and told Haskell to assist them, and then we continued on our way. Brigadier General John Gibbon, Division Commander, 2nd Corps, Army of the Potomac. All along the two-mile-long Rebel gun line, from the Peach Orchard all the way up to Oak Hill, the Confederate artillerists, sweat streaming in the heat and humidity, manned their pieces, loading and firing, loading and firing. Smoke rolled back with each shot, smothering the ground and creating a curtain of white. Lieutenant Colonel Hillary Bear of the 8th Alabama wrote that, from where he watched 50 yards behind the gun line, quote, the very air seemed as if about to take fire. The artillerists seemed like weird specters of the damned in the place of departed spirits, plying the hellish work of destruction. A federal soldier on Cemetery Ridge said that all that could be seen of the massed rebel cannon across the way were, quote, banks of white vapor from beneath which tongues of fire were incessantly darting. A soldier in the 69th Pennsylvania, lying in front of the copse of trees, stated, quote, After the cannonading began, we were all hugging the earth, and we would have liked to go into it if we could. In Alexander Hayes' division, Brigade Commander Colonel Thomas Smith was struck in the face with a piece of shell. When Hayes learned of it, he sent a staff officer, Lieutenant Theron Parsons, to inform Lieutenant Colonel Francis Pierce of the 108th New York that he now commanded the brigade. As Parsons approached his horse, a shell killed the animal. Starting toward the 108th New York's position on foot through the storm of cannon fire, Parsons later admitted in his diary, I went across the field towards the colonel, but no more expected to reach him than to fly. Up and down the Federal line, the infantrymen in blue endured the storm as best they could, helpless under the ceaseless bombardment, with little to do but wait it out. A soldier in Harrow's brigade, just south of the copse of trees, said, quote, All we had to do while undergoing the shelling was to chew tobacco, watch caissons explode, and wonder if the next shot would hit you. Federal infantry officers all along the line made their presence known, hoping to calm the nerves and strengthen the resolve of their men. And just a footnote, but with reference to that quote a few minutes ago from John Gibbon, the reason Gibbon was on foot was that one of the first incoming shells had killed his orderly, so obviously that man couldn't bring Gibbon his horse. Anyway, Alexander Hayes, who was mounted and whose troops were positioned in and around Ziegler's Grove, north of the Angle, rode along the ranks constantly, exposing himself to the rain of fire and trying to steal his men while they endured the pounding. The next day, a New Yorker wrote, I think he is the bravest division general I ever saw in the saddle. Most of the time he was riding up and down the lines in front of us, exhorting the boys to stand fast and fight like men. And then there was Winfield Scott Hancock, who rode slowly behind his lines on Cemetery Ridge. When told that he was exposing himself to excessive danger, Hancock simply replied that, quote, There are times when a corps commander's life doesn't count. We stayed an hour in our position, exposed not only to shelling, but also to the galling fire of rebel skirmishers. Colonel Coulter, tearing up and down the line, all of a sudden drew rein and shouted, Where in the hell is my flag? Where do you suppose that cowardly son of a bitch has skedaddled to? 
Adjutant, you hunt him up and bring him to the front. Away I went, hunting for the missing flag and man, and finding them nowhere, I returned in time to see the colonel snake the offender out from behind a stone wall where he had lain down with the flag folded up so as to avoid attracting attention. Colonel Coulter shook out the folds, put the staff in the hands of the trembling man, and double-quicked him to the front. A shell exploded close, close by, killing a horse and sending a blinding shower of gravel and dirt broadcast. The colonel, snatching up the flag again, planted the end of the staff where the shell had burst and shouted, There, orderly, hold it! If I can't get you killed in ten minutes, by God, I'll post you right up among the batteries. Turning to ride away, he grinned broadly and yelled at me, The poor devil couldn't be safer. Two shells don't often hit the same place. If he obeys, he'll be all right, and I'll know where my headquarters are. Captain Abner Small, 16th Maine Infantry, 1st Corps, Army of the Potomac. Captain Wadsworth, a son of General Wadsworth, was an aide on the staff of General Meade. While the artillery fire was still at its highest, he came to me with some directions and to make some inquiries from headquarters. We halted close together in the midst of the batteries, the horses headed in opposite directions, and our faces near together. We stood broadside to the enemy's fire. While we were talking, a percussion shell struck the ground directly under the horses and exploded. The momentum of the shell carried the fragments along, so that neither horse was struck, nor did either horse move. When the shell exploded, I was in complete control of my nerves and did not move a muscle of my body or my face. Neither did Wadsworth, but I dropped my eyes to the ground where the shell exploded, and Wadsworth did not. I never forgave myself for looking down to the ground when that shell exploded under us. I do not believe that there was a man in the entire army, save Captain Wadsworth, who could have a ten-pound shell explode under him without looking where it struck. Major Thomas Osborne, Chief of Artillery, 11th Corps, Army of the Potomac. For the Federal infantrymen on Cemetery Ridge, the pounding they were taking from the enemy cannon fire no doubt seemed to be horrible beyond description, but several factors actually worked to decrease the effectiveness of the Confederate bombardment. Numerous Federal officers noticed that many of the incoming shells passed harmlessly over the ridge to explode hundreds of yards to the rear. The reasons for this were likely rooted in the fact the Confederate gunners were less well-trained than their Federal counterparts, and they were also inexperienced at long-range firing, like they were being asked to do here on July 3rd. Then, too, there was the matter of defective fuses, which we mentioned before. After the war, in his assessment of Confederate artillery, Porter Alexander made a startling comment. Because the Ordnance Department in Richmond couldn't produce enough shells to allow the gunners to practice firing, Alexander said that, quote, The great majority of the batteries took the field without ever having fired a round in practice and passed through the war without aiming a gun at any target but the enemy. Alexander's statement seems to be supported by an examination of the limited number of battery histories published by Confederate veterans, which except for initial training very early in the war, relate few accounts of long-range target practice or live firing of any sort outside of combat situations. Most Confederate gunners on July 3rd were asked to hit targets at long range, that is, between 800 to 1,500 yards away, and so if they did indeed fail to fire their weapons except in battle, it must have had a severe impact on their accuracy, especially as they were not well-trained or experienced in the art and science of long-range firing. Artillery was the most scientifically demanding and technologically advanced aspect of 19th century warfare. 
The Confederates not only fell short in training, that is, in the practice and experience that were necessary to develop the skills needed to consistently hit a target at a mile or more, but they were also let down technologically by the fuses they were using on their shells. As we talked about previously on the podcast, when the fuses should have detonated the shells in deadly air bursts directly over the federal positions on Cemetery Ridge, instead the defective fuses allowed many of the shells to sail harmlessly into the fields beyond, back toward the Tawny Town Road, behind the front line. The abundance of these overs was nothing short of terrifying to the assorted stragglers, teamsters, and other rear area types who suddenly found themselves in the midst of the bombardment. As the Second Corps historian noted, the storm of shot and shell meant that, quote, the plain behind the ridge was almost immediately swept of all camp followers and the unordered attendants of an army. One of the worst hit sites was Army headquarters at the Widow Leister's house. Located, as it was, some 400 yards behind the center of the front line, the little white house was directly in the path of much of the misdirected Confederate shellfire. A group of newspaper reporters were gathered at Army headquarters, including Samuel Wilkeson of the New York Times, whose 19-year-old son, a lieutenant of artillery, had been mortally wounded on July 1st. Now, of the beating the Leicester House was taking... Wilkinson would write, quote, Every size and form of shell shrieked, whirled, moaned, whistled, and wrathfully fluttered over our ground. As many as six in a second, constantly two in a second, bursting and screaming over and around the headquarters made a very hell of fire. They burst in the yard, burst next to the fence on both sides, garnished as usual with the hitched horses of aides and orderlies. The fastened animals reared and plunged with terror. Then one fell, then another. A shell tore up the little step of the headquarters cottage. Another soon carried off one of its two pillars. Soon a spherical case burst opposite the open door. Another ripped through the low garret. The remaining pillar went almost immediately. When George Meade walked outside, he noticed some officers and aides sidling up to the dubious shelter provided by the lee side of the little house, that is, the side facing away from the enemy lines. Amused by the sight, Meade asked, Gentlemen, are you trying to find a safe place? Meade then took the opportunity to tell a story from the Mexican War. He said they reminded him of an incident with General Zachary Taylor, old rough and ready, at the Battle of Palo Alto in 1846. Meade told them that when the man who drove the ox cart, which took the ammunition for the heavy guns, came onto the battlefield amidst the bursting shells, he tilted up his cart and got behind it. Just then General Taylor came along, and seeing this attempt at shelter, shouted, You damned fool! Don't you know you are no safer here than anywhere else? The man replied, I don't suppose I am, General, but it kind of feels so. One trait that Meade evidently possessed was absolute coolness under fire, but the bombardment proved to be so destructive and unrelenting that, despite his protests that he needed to be where messages could find him, he finally agreed to move to a barn across the Tawny Town Road. However, it was quickly discovered that the barn was just as exposed to the enemy fire as the Leicester House. While they were at the barn, an incoming shell exploded after smashing through the boarding, sending fragments in all directions, one of which hit Chief of Staff Dan Butterfield in the chest. It was a painful blow, but not life-threatening. At any rate, after Butterfield was evacuated, Meade was informed that the signal officer on Powers Hill along the Baltimore Pike, near the site of General Slocum's headquarters, could readily communicate with the Leicester House. Meade agreed to move to Slocum's headquarters on Powers Hill and leave a signal officer behind at the Leicester House. However, shortly after reaching Powers Hill, Meade discovered that he was not linked with his old headquarters after all. 
That was because the signal officer stationed there, left to his own devices, had decided that discretion was the better part of valor and evacuated the place as soon as he could. Ignoring his staff's objections, Meade decided to return to the Leicester house. He quickly mounted up and rode off. Along the way, he met several of his aides who had lost their horses. Among them was his son, Captain George Meade, Jr., who informed his father that his horse had been killed. Meade told his son to take the horse of an orderly and to follow him. Accompanying Meade as well was Lieutenant Ranald McKenzie. By that time, the Confederate artillery fire had largely ceased, replaced by the distinctive ripping or tearing sound of great volleys of musketry, mostly crashing out from the Federal lines. And for now, that is where we'll leave George Meade. As we've mentioned before, Brigadier General Henry Hunt was the Army of the Potomac's very capable chief of artillery. It was Hunt's intention that the Federal artillery should reply only sparingly, if at all, to the massive Confederate bombardment. He recognized the rebel shell fire for what it was, an effort to, in his words, quote, crush our batteries and shake our infantry. Hunt believed that in such a situation, the greatest contribution his guns could make would be to smash the rebel infantry when it appeared. That meant that his artillery crews had to refrain from counter-battery fire that would use up their ready supplies of spherical case and shell before the enemy foot soldiers came out into the open and started forward across the fields toward Cemetery Ridge. To prevent the Federal artillery from expending all of their long-range ammunition in gun-to-gun duels with the Confederates, Hunt's orders had been clear. The Union batteries were to withhold fire for 15 to 20 minutes after the start of the enemy bombardment, and then reply, quote, deliberately and slowly as at target practice. And so the Federal artillery crews stood at their posts, the cannon loaded and primed, waiting under the storm of Confederate fire. But with each passing moment, the maelstrom worsened. Many of the enemy shells were going long, as we've already mentioned, but the sheer volume of fire was ensuring that enough rounds were hitting their targets that it was making life decidedly unpleasant for the Federal gun crews and infantry on Cemetery Ridge. Before long, before Hunt's prescribed time limit had expired, the five Second Corps batteries on the front line exploded with a roar. They started firing because it had been one thing to withstand the enemy fire. It was another matter entirely to cross a furious Winfield Scott Hancock. Right. You see, Hancock interfered with the management of the artillery, much to the irritation of Hunt and many battery commanders. The Second Corps commander had never been shy on a battlefield, and he eagerly accepted the responsibility of defending the Federal Center. However, the Confederate bombardment brought out the best and the worst in him. As we've already indicated, Hancock, after the start of the bombardment, wanted to make himself visible to the troops, inspiring them with his example of coolness under fire. So he rode along the lines on his favorite black horse. He started on the right of the Second Corps line and proceeded slowly to the left, followed by his staff and the Corps pennant flying high. But the same desire to inspire the troops resulted in a bitter controversy that would fester for many years, all because Hancock decided his men needed to hear their own artillery giving it back to the rebels. Hancock knew that infantry can, with training and experience, put up with a good many things on a battlefield, but the one danger most likely to try the patience and wear on the morale of a foot soldier is to have to stand or lie under artillery fire with no way of responding. A soldier in a Massachusetts regiment said, quote, The suspense of such moments is terrible, and each moment seems an age. Noticing that his own 2nd Corps batteries weren't returning the enemy's fire set off a fury in Hancock. 
he ordered his artillery chief, Captain John Hazard, to get to work. The confused Hazard replied that Hunt's instructions were to wait to return the enemy's fire, but Hancock was having none of it, and within moments the five Second Corps batteries were throwing shells towards Seminary Ridge as fast as the gunners could load and fire. It galled Hancock even more to see that, just to the south, Lieutenant Colonel Freeman McGilvery's substantial gun line was standing silent. You see, using cannon from the Army's artillery reserve, McGilvery had concentrated 39 guns from eight batteries several hundred yards south of the Copse of Trees. These batteries, because of the lay of the land, seemed to have been completely unnoticed by the Confederates on July 3rd, but as it happened, McGilvery's guns would have a superb lateral view of the ground over which Pickett's men would advance during the charge. According to McGilvery, Hancock, quote, came riding up to him in hot haste. And Hancock demanded to know, quote, why in hell you do not open fire with those batteries? Hancock might be able to order his own corps artillery around as he pleased, but McGilvery's guns belonged to the Army's artillery reserve, and he took his orders from Henry Hunt. When McGilvery pointed this out to Hancock, the second corps commander said his men were taking a pounding and, quote, unless our batteries opened fire, his troops would not stand it much longer. Hancock was known for his colorful language on a battlefield anyway, but when McGilvery still refused to open fire, it apparently motivated Hancock to let loose with a red-hot stream of cursing that the recipient described as, quote, profane and blasphemous, such as a drunken ruffian would use, end quote. Freeman McGilvery had originally left New England as a sailor, which is a profession that has a bit of a reputation for swearing, so he probably was the best choice for Hancock to try to intimidate with a profanity-laden rant. Indeed, unimpressed with the irate general's arguments, McGilvery responded that he wasn't under Hancock's orders, and for good measure, said that, quote, I could not see why the Second Corps could not stand the fire as well as the other troops, or as well as my gunners. Hancock rode to several of the batteries and ordered them to open fire, which a few of them did. But as soon as Hancock galloped away, McGilvery ordered them to cease fire. He later said that Hancock, quote, seemed unnecessarily excited, was unduly emphatic, and as there was nothing in sight except puffs of smoke 1,500 and more yards away, his orders would result in a most dangerous and irreparable waste of ammunition. Arguments over this incident and over whether infantry officers ought to have control over artillery on a battlefield would heat up between Hancock and Hunt after the war the two outspoken officers never reconciled their differences. Meanwhile, here at Gettysburg on the afternoon of July 3rd, the air seethed with old iron, as a soldier in the 17th Maine put it. A man in Hayes' division in Ziegler's Grove, where severed limbs from the oak and hickory trees rained down, noted that the birds in the grove began to fly wildly in the air, quote, all out of their wits with fright. Across the way on Seminary Ridge, as the continual discharges and concussive blasts from the Confederate guns seemed to tear apart the very air, a soldier in the 16th Mississippi was amazed to see that, quote, birds attempting to fly tumbled and fell to the ground. As the five Second Corps batteries from Ziegler's Grove to south of the Copse of Trees returned shot for shot with the Confederate gunners on Seminary Ridge, they were soon joined by other Federal cannon on Little Round Top and Cemetery Hill. In all, perhaps as many as 250 guns on both sides belched forth their fire and smoke that Friday afternoon, producing a continuous and deafening roar. On Seminary Ridge, the rebel infantry of Pickett's, Pettigrew's, and Trimble's divisions, positioned behind the Confederate gun line, 
waited for the orders to advance, and in the meantime suffered from the federal shelling. Dozens, perhaps hundreds of Pickett's and Pettigrew's men were hit during the bombardment, killed or wounded before even stepping off for the attack. Few Confederate infantrymen had any protection except that offered by lying flat on the ground under a broiling summer sun. Every time an enemy shell hit the ranks, it tore men apart or flung them into the air, often in spectacularly horrifying fashion. Captain John Dooley of the 1st Virginia remembered that, quote, Orders were to lie as closely as possible to the ground, and I, like a good soldier, never got closer to the earth than on the present occasion. A shell killed two brothers in the 11th Virginia in Kemper's Brigade, Privates Thomas and William Jennings. On Kemper's left, among Garnett's men, a shell killed two privates in the 8th Virginia, Benjamin Jackson and Albert Morris, whom their major described as quote-unquote devoted friends and who were lying next to each other on the ground. Also in Garnett's brigade, Lieutenant Colonel John T. Ellis of the 19th Virginia was mortally wounded when a solid shot, bounding across the ground, smashed into his face as he raised his head to see why someone had shouted, Look out! Carried to the rear, Ellis lingered a few hours before dying. To the rear of Garnett, Lewis Armstead walked among his men, trying to calm them. Armistead told them, Lie still, boys. There is no safe place here. A bit farther north on Seminary Ridge, Johnston Pettigrew's troops hugged the ground like their comrades in Pickett's division. Burkett Fry and James Marshall lost dozens of officers and men from their brigades. Fry called the incoming artillery fire, quote, that deadly storm of hissing and exploding shells. One of the first soldiers hit in Pettigrew's division was Sergeant Jeremiah Gage of the 11th Mississippi. A fragment of a shell ripped Gage's upper left arm and tore open his abdomen. When a surgeon told him that the wound was fatal, Gage asked for pencil, paper, and a knapsack for a desk. Despite the agony, he wrote to his mother, telling her, This is the last you may ever hear from me. I have time to tell you that I died like a man. Remember that I am true to my country, and my greatest regret at dying is that she is not free, and that you and my sisters are robbed of my worth, whatever that may be. I hope this will reach you, and you must not regret that my body cannot be obtained. It is a mere matter of form anyhow. This letter is stained with my blood. Did archaeologists discover Noah's Ark? Is the rapture coming as soon as the Euphrates River dries up? Does the Bible condemn abortion? Don't you wish you had a trustworthy academic resource to help make sense of all of this? Well, I'm Dan Beecher, and he's award-winning Bible scholar and TikTok sensation Dr. Dan McClellan. And we want to invite you to the Data Over Dogma podcast. Where our mission is to increase public access to the academic study of the Bible and religion, and also to combat the spread of misinformation about the same. But, you know, in a fun way. Every week we tackle fascinating topics, we go back to source materials in their original languages, and we interview top scholars in the field. So whether you're a devout believer, or you're just interested in a clear-eyed, deeply informed look at one of the most influential books of all time, we think you're going to love the Data Over Dogma podcast. Wherever you subscribe to awesome shows. History never says goodbye. It just says, see you later. Edward Galliano was right when he said that. Events keep happening over and over again in some form. And that's the reason I produce the podcast, My History Can Beat Up Your Politics. What is it? We take stories of history and apply them to the events of today to help you perhaps understand them better. We are also part of Airwave Media Network. I've been doing the program since 2006. That's a long time, and the show has a long name. My history can beat up your politics. Find me wherever you get podcasts.
We patiently waited and wished, though dreaded, for the signal to commence the action and probably for the order that would seal our fate. My company was ordered to lie down and await until the artillery had ceased firing. Soon the signal gun was fired, and then from the throats of over 200 cannon, such a storm of shot and shells were sent forth as no battlefield in America ever witnessed before. The Federals were not taken by surprise, for in a few seconds their solid shot were tearing up the ground around us and their shells bursting in our very faces. I have heard and witnessed heavy cannonading, but never in my life had I seen or heard anything equal to this. Some enthusiasts back in the commissary department may speak of it as grand and sublime, but unless grandeur and sublimity consist in what is terrible and horrible, it is wanting in both of those qualities. While this artillery duel was in progress, we were lying in a field with a very heavy growth of grass, so thick, in fact, it was impossible for any wind to get through it, and this, with the intense heat of the sun, produced several cases of sunstroke among our men. Captain John T. James, 11th Virginia Infantry, Kemper's Brigade, Pickett's Division, Longstreet's Corps, Army of Northern Virginia. I began to breathe a, breathe a little more freely and raised my head off the ground and looked around, whereupon Lieutenant Brown said to me, You had better put your head down or you may get it knocked off. I replied, Well, Lieutenant, a man had about as well die that way than suffocate for want of air. I had barely spoken these words when a terrific explosion occurred, which for a moment deprived me of breath and of sensibility, but it was momentary, for in a moment I found myself lying off from my former position and gasping for breath. Around me were brains, blood, and skull bones. My first thought was that my colonel's head had been blown off, but this was dispelled the next moment by his asking me if I was badly hurt, to which I replied I thought I was, and called for that which a wounded man always first wants, a drink of water. The colonel sprang up and called for someone to bring water. By this time I had turned about and discovered the heads of the two men who lay on my left side had been blown off just over the ears and that the shell had exploded almost directly over me, a little below my left shoulder blade, breaking several of my ribs from my backbone, bruising severely my left lung, and cutting my gray jacket almost to shreds and filling it with grains of powder. Sergeant David E. Johnston, 7th Virginia Infantry, Kemper's Brigade. Then the arms were stacked and the men allowed to rest at will, but one thing was especially noticeable. From being unusually merry and hilarious, they on a sudden had become as still and thoughtful as Quakers. Walking up the line to where Colonel Patton was standing in front of the 7th Virginia, I said to him, This news has brought about an awful seriousness with our fellows. Yes, he replied, and well they may be serious, if they really know what is in store for them. I have been up yonder and looked across at the Yankees. While we were talking, an order came to move up nearer the artillery. This was done, and the final preparations made for the advance. The first shot or two flew harmlessly over our heads, but soon they began to get the range, and then, well what General Gibbon on the other side called pandemonium. First there was an explosion in the top of our friendly tree, sending a shower of limbs upon us. In a second there was another, followed by a piercing shriek, which caused Patton to spring up and run to see what was the matter. Two killed outright and three frightfully wounded, he said on his return. Immediately after, a like cry came from another apple tree close by, in the midst of the 3rd Virginia. Company F had suffered terribly. First Lieutenant A.P. Gomer, legs shattered below the knee. Of the Arthur brothers, second and third lieutenants, one killed and the other badly hit. Orderly Sergeant Murray, mortally wounded. And of the privates, one killed and three wounded. Then, for more than an hour, it went on. 
Nearly every minute the cry of mortal agony was heard above the roar and rumble of the guns. Colonel Joseph Mayo, 3rd Virginia Infantry, Kemper's Brigade. The rebel artillerymen did their solid best to prepare the way for the Confederate infantry. They endured the counter-battery fire from the Federal guns and sweated through the blistering heat and the searing powder smoke and the deafening noise, loading and firing their pieces, loading and firing, over and over. Porter Alexander endured the worst few minutes of his wartime career after the bombardment began. He was saddled with the responsibility of gauging the effect of the Confederate cannon fire and deciding when the rebel infantry should step off. Alexander had the experience and the grit to do this, and he had in mind a certain period of time the firing would go on before he'd send word for the infantry to start. But that plan fell through almost as soon as the, as the bombardment began. In his memoir, Alexander would say, quote, It was just after 1 p.m. by my watch when the signal guns were fired and the cannonade opened. The enemy replied rather slowly at first, though soon with increasing rapidity. Having determined that Pickett should charge, I felt impatient to launch him as soon as I could see that our fire was accomplishing anything. I guessed that a half hour would elapse between my sending him the order and his column reaching close quarters with the enemy. I did not presume on using more ammunition than one hour's firing would consume, for we were far from supplies and had already fought for two days. So I determined to send Pickett the order at the very first favorable sign and not later than after 30 minutes firing. At the end of 20 minutes, no favorable development had occurred. More guns had been added to the Federal line than at the beginning, and its whole length, about two miles, was blazing like a volcano. It seemed madness to order a column in the middle of a hot July day to undertake an advance of three-fourths of a mile over open ground against the center of that line. Of that daunting stretch of open ground and the federal cannon fire, Alexander would write after the war, quote, I did not believe any infantry could traverse half the necessary distance under it. I could not bring myself to do it. The only course of action was to wait, allow the Confederate artillery to suppress the Federal batteries, and then give the word for the rebel infantry to start off. So Alexander waited for a full 25 minutes after the bombardment opened, but still there was no reduction in the enemy fire. He worried that the Confederate artillery ammunition would be so depleted by the sustained firing that it would hinder his ability to support the infantry's advance. Alexander was also concerned about the condition of Pickett's men, who had marched from Chambersburg the day before, and now broiled under the oppressive sun and suffered under the storm of shells. He didn't want to wait so long as to exhaust them before the attack began. There was also the uncertainty as to how long it would take for the infantry to get ready once he gave the signal. He later wrote, I could not be sure that Pickett's column might not waste ten minutes or more in dressing ranks, alignments, guides, or some little tactical niceties, and every minute now seemed an hour. Alexander decided to act, but he didn't want to simply say, charge. He, quote, thought it due to Longstreet and to Pickett to let the exact situation be understood, end quote. So at 125, he wrote a short note to Pickett. Alexander's note to Pickett read, General, if you are able to advance at all, you must come at once, or we will not be able to support you as we ought. But the enemy's fire has not slackened materially, and there are still 18 guns firing from the cemetery. Rather than Cemetery Hill, Alexander actually meant the area around the angle, where the 16 guns belonging to the five Second Corps batteries were blazing away. He later admitted being confused about the name of this spot, but he clearly understood it to be the focal point of the Confederate attack. 
A few minutes after he sent off that note, Alexander was surprised and encouraged by a sudden development. It appeared as if the volume of fire of the enemy guns around the angle was quickly diminishing. In fact, it appeared to Porter Alexander as if the enemy pieces were leaving their positions and pulling out. He also noted that the fire along the other parts of the Federal line seemed to be decreasing as well. This was an unexpected turn of events. Alexander's prior combat experience had told him the Yankees rarely gave in during an artillery duel because they usually had so much ammunition they could be extravagant with it. But now this lavishness with fire seemed to be breaking down. Alexander believed the unprecedented volume of rebel cannon fire must have finally taken its toll. He said, I knew that they must have felt the punishment a good deal, and I was a good deal elated by the sight. However, poor Alexander wanted to be sure, so he waited another five minutes, carefully scanning the federal position with his field glasses, desperate to catch some telltale sign through the smoke. Finally, he became convinced that this window of opportunity, slight though it might be, was the Confederate infantry's best chance. At 1.40, Porter Alexander wrote another note to George Pickett. It read, The 18 guns have been driven off. For God's sake, come on quick, or we cannot support you. Ammunition nearly out. Alexander then walked to the nearest gun and sent off a lieutenant and a sergeant, each with a copy of the note. To make the point more emphatically, he also sent a third messenger with a verbal restatement of the note. All of this was because Alexander wanted to impress Pickett with the need for haste, since he was still worried the brigades would w waste precious time in dressing ranks and so forth before starting off. What exactly had Porter Alexander seen to make him so excited about the prospect of success? Well, he certainly detected a slackening of fire coming from the Federal guns around the angle. This was a genuine example of the Confederate cannon gaining a superiority over Union artillery because the Second Corps batteries along Hancock's line on Cemetery Bridge had been devastated by the concentrated rebel fire. Alexander accurately gauged this, although he erroneously believed that 18 enemy guns had pulled out from the area around the angle. He probably caught a glimpse or two of the withdrawal of a few battered batteries and assumed that more were pulling out as well, but they were hidden from his view by the smoke that still engulfed the battlefield. The decrease in fire Alexander detected among the other parts of the Federal line was the result of orders those batteries received to cease firing. As one who respected the power of artillery, Henry Hunt described the enemy cannonade as quote-unquote incredibly grand. But he, along with many other officers in blue, knew that this great show of rebel cannon fire was but a prelude to a big Confederate infantry attack. Hunt was on Cemetery Hill as the bombardment raged the hottest, discussing the situation with Otis Howard and other 11th Corps officers. Major Thomas Osborne, the Corps' artillery chief, stated that if the rebels were, indeed, preparing to charge, would it not be a good idea for Hunt to order the Federal guns to cease fire, giving the false impression that they had been suppressed by the enemy cannonade? essentially to lure the Confederates out. Hunt thought it was a splendid idea. Riding south from the hilltop, he ordered batteries to cease fire, and the Federal guns, one by one, went quiet. Hunt also ordered some of the battered pieces to withdraw and sent for new, fresh batteries to take their place. Over on Seminary Ridge, Porter Alexander noted this slackening of fire and through the smoke glimpsed Federal cannon being wheeled away. With his own supply of ammunition dwindling alarmingly, Alexander believed that the time had now come for the Confederate infantry to advance.
After receiving the note that Porter Alexander had penned at 125, George Pickett had went straight to James Longstreet. He found Longstreet sitting on top of a rail fence that stretched eastward from Spangler's Woods toward Cemetery Ridge. Pickett showed him Alexander's note and asked, General, shall I advance? James Longstreet now found himself at the decisive moment of an unwanted duty. He didn't believe Lee's plan could succeed, but now he was being asked to give the final word that would send 12,000 men stepping off into one of the most deadly and difficult assaults of the war. Longstreet found he could not voice an answer to Pickett. He later explained that, quote, My feelings had so overcome me that I would not speak for fear of betraying my want of confidence to him. When Longstreet nodded his head as an affirmative gesture, Pickett said, I shall lead my division forward, sir. And then he rode off to get the men of his three brigades up and ready to advance. After watching Pickett ride confidently, even happily, away, Longstreet got down off his perch on the fence and mounted up. He rode over to get one last report from Porter Alexander. When he reached the gun line, Longstreet found Alexander with another artillery officer, Major John Haskell. Haskell remembered how, quote, his first question was what we thought we had done. Alexander thought, and Haskell agreed, that they had, quote, silenced the guns of the enemy. That was well and good, but when Alexander explained the nearly exhausted ammunition chests of the guns, Longstreet suddenly snapped to life and ordered Alexander to stop Pickett until more artillery ammunition could be brought forward. We think it's curious, shall we say, that Longstreet again refused to stop Pickett himself, but wanted Porter Alexander to do it. But, in any case, Alexander pointed out that the delay would simply give the Federals time to recover from whatever damage they had suffered. And furthermore, Alexander said, bringing forward more shells wouldn't matter that much in the end, since even then the Confederate artillery didn't have enough ammunition on hand in Pennsylvania to fire for more than 15 additional minutes anyway. Porter Alexander's message was clear. Whatever artillery preparation had been done would have to be sufficient, and any delay now would waste the effort already expended. He told Longstreet, quote, Our only chance is to follow it up now, to strike while the iron is hot. Longstreet responded slowly while gazing toward the federal lines. Almost more to himself than to Alexander, Old Pete said, I don't want to make this attack. I believe it will fail. I do not see how it can succeed. I would not make it even now, but that General Lee has ordered it and expects it. Alexander remembered this moment in detail. How Longstreet spoke these words, quote, with slight pauses in between while he was looking at the enemy's position through his field glasses. I had the feeling that he was upon the verge of stopping the charge and that with even slight encouragement he would do it. But that very feeling kept me from saying a word, so I stood by and looked on, in silence almost embarrassing. Meanwhile, Pickett's brigade commanders, Richard Garnett, James Kemper, and Louis Armistead, had been hastily getting their men to their feet and ready to advance. George Pickett yelled to those within earshot, Up, men, up, and to your posts, and don't forget today that you are from Old Virginia. After conversing briefly with Kemper, Pickett rode next to Garnett. With no flowery rhetoric, Pickett simply instructed Garnett to, quote, Get across those fields as quick as you can, for in my opinion, you are going to catch hell. Behind Garnett's line, Armistead was doing his best to inspire his troops, urging them, quote, Men, remember what you are fighting for. Remember your homes and your friends, your wives, mothers, sisters, and your sweethearts. 
To the left of Pickett's men, the brigades under Pettigrew and Trimble also readied for the charge. It was Captain John Dooley of the 1st Virginia who perhaps best captured the thoughts racing through the men's minds as they prepared to go forward. Quote, I tell you there is no romance in making these charges. When you rise to your feet, I tell you the enthusiasm of ardent breast in many cases ain't there, and instead of burning to avenge the insults of our country, families, and altars, and firesides, the thought is most frequently, oh, if I could just come out of this charge safely, how thankful would I be. Lieutenant Francis Dawson of Longstreet staff overheard an exchange between Lou Armistead and Dick Garnett, quote, Prayers were offered up in front of Armistead's brigade and Garnett's brigade before the advance began. Garnett remarked to Armistead, This is a desperate thing to attempt. Brave old Armistead replied, It is, but the issue is with the Almighty, and we must leave it in his hands. Just then a hare which had been lying in the bushes sprang up and leaped rapidly to the rear. A gaunt Virginian with an earnestness that struck a sympathetic chord in many a breast, yelled out, Run, old hare! If I were an old hare, I would run too. That means it's time for this episode's book recommendation, and our recommendation this time is Pickett's Charge, Eyewitness Accounts at the Battle of Gettysburg, Edited by Richard Rollins. We know that many of you enjoy the first-person accounts we include with a lot of episodes, including this show, which had quite a few. There are a number of sources we use for those first-person accounts, but an excellent one for Pickett's Charge, including its planning, preparation, the bombardment, and the aftermath, is this book, edited by Richard Rollins. It has over 170 first-person accounts, and we found it to be an invaluable resource. Don't forget, you can find all of our book recommendations if you head over to the podcast website, which is www.civilwarpodcast.org. As we wrap up the show, we want to thank the newest members of the Strawfoot Brigade for their support of the show. Corey D., Scott C., C.E. Westfall, Nicholas G., Casey J., and Bruce P. Joe G., Dave C., Bobby L., Courtney N., David R., David W., and Andrew M. And thanks to Diane G., Courtney N., David G., and Jonathan N. for their recent donations. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Civil War, 1861 to 1865, a history podcast. Rich and I do hope that you join us again next time, but until then, take care. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.